Hey everyone! The summer has ended, but I must admit that it wasn't really much of a holiday for me. In order to keep my family satisfied, I had to build a new bathroom in our house. Now, normal people would hire a specialist to do this and then spend their time on other things like watching YouTube videos, but not me. I had to do this myself. Ah oh, well, I enjoy the practical challenges of such a project and I always learn a lot, especially from the things I've never done before. Plus, new projects always give me new insights and ideas. The space in most bathrooms has a very geometric appearance. The orthogonal tile patterns are suggesting order, dimensionality, spaciousness, but in fact the tiles are just a facade to hide away the messy details from view, all the tubing and wiring that are the true purpose of a bathroom. Because in essence a bathroom is about distributing flows of energy and matter to and from locations where they're needed, or not needed anymore. And in fact, this distribution system is the reason why you would want to have a bathroom in the first place. I must admit that this project required quite a lot more brain power than I expected, and especially all the unexpected details of the build process sometimes kept me awake at night. In the middle of the night I would start thinking about plumbing and drainage configurations, but as always, after some time, my mind would wander off to other things, like what is energy and why is it always conserved? Is everything made of energy? And why is it that gravity is about energy and not just about mass? What about space? Is space also a form of energy? So many questions, so little time left to sleep. If we think about energy conservation, it's usually in the form of macroscopic or classical energy, like kinetic energy and potential energy being transferred back and forth in a pendulum. Or you might think about how kinetic energy of an object is converted into an equivalent amount of heat. And this heat is basically a different manifestation of kinetic energy, but then distributed among individual molecules. Energy conservation is also observed on the atomic scale. Shown here is a schematic with the fusion reaction of deuterium and tritium. And in order for these two elements to engage in a nuclear fusion reaction, you need to supply them with a certain amount of kinetic energy first, equal to about a half a mega electron volt. Now if you look on the other side of the reaction, you see that the products contain a total amount of kinetic energy that is far greater, about 17.6 mega electron volts, which at first glance seems to be in conflict with the energy conservation law, because no protons or neutrons have gone missing in the reaction. However, if we carefully measure the total atomic weights on both sides of the reaction, we see that the total mass of the particles after the reaction is smaller than before the reaction. But we did get something in return, a net amount of 17.1 mega electron volt, or 2.74 times 10 to the minus 12 joules. So this is what Einstein's famous relationship refers to, mass being equivalent to energy. If we apply this formula to the mass gone missing, we arrive at an energy equivalent of 2.74 times 10 to the minus 12 joules, which is in fact exactly the net energy we got out of the reaction. But if you study individual elementary particles a bit closer, they do not behave like macroscopic or classical objects at all. They behave like oscillations or waves that contain a specific amount of energy. In that respect, one of the most important realizations is one that was proposed by Louis de Broglie. By combining Einstein's formula on mass-energy equivalency and Planck's postulate that energy is always quantized in packages of a specific frequency, he concluded that mass should have frequency, or wavelength, and the exact value should be dependent on momentum. And in all kinds of experiments it was indeed confirmed that elementary particles demonstrate behavior previously only attributed to wave phenomena, like, for example, interference. This starting point led to a theory in which every particle is basically a wave that can be described by a wave function and has a corresponding probability distribution in space, which then led to the development of quantum field theory, a very successful theory that can accurately describe many interactions between particles and radiation. But there is this one aspect of quantum field theory that to me as an outsider intuitively doesn't make sense at all, 
and that is its requirement for the presence of vacuum energy. Say that we have this volume of space and we isolate it from everything else. We remove every single molecule, essentially creating a vacuum. Now on top of that we remove all electromagnetic radiation and then cool down the surroundings to a temperature of absolute zero. And after we've done this, the space made up of this absolute vacuum still exists, right? Yep. Oops. Well, actually, there is no way to tell for sure. However, according to quantum field theory, this completely empty space must still contain a huge energy density. Now, why is that? Well, in quantum field theory, vacuum is a quantum field in its minimum energy state, and the value of the energy contained in the field is not equal to zero. Or maybe I should talk about fields, because every fundamental particle, like an electron or a quark or a photon, is assigned its own field. In these images, fields are presented in 2D, but of course, this is just a graphics limitation. There are actually three-dimensional fields which are spatially overlapping with each other. And particles can be thought of as additional vibrational energy present in these fields. So, what is this lowest energy content of a quantum field? Well, as for the values that pop up everywhere, it must be somewhere around 10 to the 114 joules per cubic meter of space, give or take a few orders of magnitude. And the value originates from the assumption that in the quantum world, space has the smallest dimension and the energy of a vibration has the smallest value. In quantum mechanics, a field is assumed to consist of a very high number of coupled quantum oscillators that can distribute energy in space in the form of waves. And so, this field allows for the progression of waves with their related frequencies and energy. The thing is that these quantum oscillators cannot be at rest and have zero energy. And this follows directly from one of the other fundaments of quantum mechanics, the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. This principle states that the product of the uncertainty in position and momentum of, well, anything basically, cannot be zero. And therefore, the amount of energy contained in a quantum oscillator can also not be zero. Even for one specific frequency, a quantum oscillator must contain a minimum energy that is equal to half times the Planck constant times the frequency. And since a field consisting of these oscillators must be able to support all frequencies, the initial conclusion is that the vacuum energy should be infinite. Now, that is a tough value to sell to anybody. So, to make the vacuum energy finite, people have suggested limiting the number of frequencies supported by the field, which then results in a value of the vacuum energy that is finite, but should still have a ridiculously high value. Because it is so high, it's easy to immediately discard this number as complete nonsense. But let's for a moment assume that space indeed does contain around 10 to the 114 joules per cubic meter. And let's try to put that value into perspective. We've just discussed the conversion of mass into energy in a fusion reaction. And similar fusion processes occur in our sun. If you look at how much mass is being converted into energy in the sun every second, this is 4.3 billion kilograms. Quite a lot actually. But still, this means that in order to generate the energy content of only one cubic meter of empty space, the sun would have to burn for 8.3 times 10 to the 79 years, which by itself would be impossible since the total lifetime of the sun is estimated to be only 10 billion years, an absolute minuscule fraction of that. Given this comparison and the fact that a sphere with our solar system in it, contains at least 10 to the 39 cubic meter of space, I guess it's not surprising that most people at least have some reservations about this estimate of vacuum energy. And this is where it gets tricky. If you're a follower of quantum religion, you cannot just discard vacuum energy as a tiny little glitch. And that is because the concept of empty space having a high energy content lies at the heart of the theory. Now, there is a lot of space around us that is almost empty and that we can study. And of course, astronomers and cosmologists have tried to put this value for vacuum energy or dark energy to the test. So, by looking at how much space expands and what the expansion would mean in terms of dark energy, they have also tried to put a number on this value. 
and they arrive at a value that is 123 orders of magnitude lower. By the way, it's good to add that even though this value is much lower, it's still higher than the estimated average energy density of mass in the visible universe. So what that would mean is that on average there is more energy contained in space than in mass. There is a catch though. Lately there has been discussion about whether this dark energy even exists, because the observation on which the estimated values are based are apparently flawed, so dark energy might not even exist after all. Regardless of the exact value of the vacuum energy of space, if it exists, why wouldn't we notice at all? Well, you could state that vacuum is the baseline for everything around us. It's the zero point to which everything else adds. So if a quantum field is omnipresent and uniform, we would not be able to tell anything about its absolute value by doing a measurement, nor would we be able to interact with it. Imagine you are on an ocean in a small boat. The water is very muddy and you cannot look beneath the surface. The only thing you can see are these wave phenomena on the surface. You have no clue how deep the ocean actually is. It could be 100 meters deep or 10,000 meters deep or maybe more. Now say that you have some theory with which you can accurately predict the behavior of every time of wave. And it contains the depth of the ocean as a constant. As a consequence of your observations, you had to accept that the ocean should be almost infinitively deep. And in the meantime, others have discovered that your ocean is on a planet that is much, much smaller in diameter than the value you found. What would you do? Claim that the diameter value is wrong? Or call the ocean depth one of the great unsolved mysteries and just carry on because the math works so well? Or would you search for an alternative theory that gives the same results but somehow is more in agreement with your intuition. Whatever it is you do, you should always be aware that your theoretical framework probably has some serious issues. It might give you the right answers, but for all the wrong reasons. Now, one of the things that has always bothered me a bit about quantum mechanics is the way probability is interpreted. And let me try to explain what I mean with that. Here's a simulation of how a quantum particle behaves in terms of probability when faced with a couple of choices. And the simulation was done by Niels Berglund, who runs a really great YouTube channel where he showcases all kinds of physics simulations. It's definitely worth taking a look at his channel if you're into visual representations of physical phenomena. In this 2D representation, we start out by placing a quantum particle in a particular location with some momentum. On the left you see a graphic of the wave function with the phase of the wave represented as a color palette. And to the right we see what this means in terms of spatial probability. Really doesn't matter what this particle is exactly, but it might for example be a moving electron. Now watch what happens to the wave function and probability while it develops in space and time. And especially interesting is what happens when it elastically collides with an obstruction. In this case, it's presented a barrier with two openings, so basically the double slit experiment. And you see how the wave function of this particle redistributes itself in space. Part of the particle's wave is reflected and the other part is transmitted to the other side of the barrier, where we observe the formation of an interference pattern. Now at first glance you might think that what you see here is purely about wave energy redistributing itself in space. But in fact, that's not really what it shows you. The graph is showing you the probability of detecting the full particle. So the full energy of the particle might sometimes pop up here or here, but for example, never here. So when we try to detect this type of particle, we sort of question the field in any particular location, and sometimes it gives us a complete particle as an answer. Now, let me try to formulate what exactly is bothering me with this view. Let's assume that the particle is indeed an electron moving at a non-relativistic speed. Its mass represents an amount of energy, about half a mega electron volt. According to quantum field theory, the energy is distributed in this electron field consisting of coupled quantum oscillators that always have at least a minimum amount of vibrational energy. 
and the energy of the electron is also contained in the oscillators as some kind of wave or additional vibrational energy. Assume for a moment that this plot represents the probability of detection of some part of the wave function. If we place some means of detection, for example here, we might detect the particle there. And at that moment we know where it is and in quantum mechanics it is then stated that the complete wave function collapses, whatever that means. Now, in my view, you cannot distribute a wave over a bunch of oscillators without also distributing the energy of that wave. Also, what quantum mechanics leads us to believe is that the particle is there because we're trying to detect it. This contrary to the classical view that we detect the particle because it's actually right there. From what I understand, in quantum field theory, the observation of a particle is more or less like doing a transaction with the total field. And so the only way that the field can come up with the full energy contained in the particle locally is by assuming that this field has a very high energy content itself. This brings me to the question what a quantum measurement actually is. In classical mechanics, doing a measurement is generally about determining a specific property of an object. We try to put a value, for example, on its speed or mass or temperature. And these properties are macroscopic and intrinsic to the object. But doing a measurement on a quantum system is in essence about transferring information to the macroscopic world. It's about making something initially unknown manifest itself in the classical domain. In other words, it's about creating statistical significance. And let me try to explain what I mean with this. Say we have this setup where we want to detect individual electrons. We have two compartments that are under a very high vacuum. And in this compartment we generate electrons from a heated filament because we have found that it emits them. Now in the center of the wall separating the two compartments we have a tiny hole and this is the location where we want to do our quantum measurement. Let's say that we want to detect when a single electron is at or around this specific location. What we could do is add another positively charged electrode and accelerate the electron so that it moves towards that electrode. And in principle this represents a current. However, we would not be able to measure the current of a single electron. For one, because the resulting signal would be completely lost in the jitter of the trillions of electrons that are present in the electric lines. But if we were to add a device called a channel plate, we might be able to detect a single electron near this hole. Because this one electron can result in an avalanche of electrons in the channel plate, say a million or so. And so now this single electron can generate a statistically significant event, namely a current that can be detected on the macroscopic scale. And in this way we can translate a property of a quantum particle into a classical phenomenon. The question is of course, did something get lost in translation? Now, I think that this is indeed the case. For one, the true cause of probability. For example, in the experiment we cannot distinguish between an electron having a probability distribution that extends in space up or beyond the hole, or it being a localized particle that, merely due to classical stochastics, happens to be at that particular location. Now you might wonder, what about the interference effects that are observed with electrons in the double slit experiment, even if we detect only one at a time? Does this not prove that particles are entities with probability distributed in space? Well, the point is, we do not actually observe interference from a single particle or a single detection. In order to observe interference, we would have to detect many events to statistically confirm that it is indeed present. So, something very similar here. We test probability many times in a row, and by doing so, we make interference into something statistically significant. But in the end, the only thing that interference indicates is that our measurement is somehow governed by a wave phenomenon. So, to avoid a high vacuum energy requirement, one could as an alternative return to particles essentially being local wave phenomena that exist in their own right. That they do not require any omnipresent invisible high energy field to exist. Think of a particle as an oscillation that is constantly directing energy inwards, a bit like for example a ring vortex. The presence of a circular energy flow could lead to 
wave-like behavior. And so energy does not have to be distributed over a gazillion quantum oscillators. In fact, all phenomena involving interference could in essence just as well arrive from localized wave behavior that strives to keep its internal energy together. While searching for an example of this, I discovered a fascinating video on the Veritasium channel about small oil droplets that behave very similar to quantum particles. And I really suggest you check out this video if you haven't already seen it. So in that video, stabilized droplets, which are of course purely classical phenomena, are bouncing around on the surface of a liquid and are interacting with standing waves. Now the latter is important because the energy in standing waves can actually be very localized, in this case around a droplet. So droplet and surface are constantly transferring energy back and forth to each other in a system that behaves both as a particle and a wave. And I think this is a beautiful example of particle wave duality in the classical domain. The droplets apparently even demonstrate interference in the same way as is observed in quantum systems. Of course, in this example, the droplet wave entities are kept alive by an external energy source, because as a system they suffer from energy losses, like friction in the air and liquid. But try to imagine how these would behave in the absence of friction. In the end, I guess it's all about what you believe. Do you believe that there exist omnipresent high energy fields? Or are particles maybe self-supporting oscillations in their own right? Or maybe there's something completely different? Please let me know what you think in the comments of this video. In the meantime, I'll be in my bathroom, trying to get at least some of the energy back that went into building that little piece of space.